All right, guys, so in week 12, we're going to be learning all about the cerebellum. So the main things we're going to go over um, in this week is going to be just the general anatomy, and we're going to look at two different ways that we can split the cerebellum. Uh, we're going to be looking at the functions, the deep cerebellar nuclei, the layers of the uh, cerebellar cortex, how do you get in and out of the cerebellum, and then if we have cerebellar damage or damage in the cerebellum, what kinds of um, signs are, are, is our patients going to show? So let's start off with some anatomy. So if we take a side view of our brain here, so here's our cerebrum, here's our frontal lobes, um, frontal lobe, um, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, but below all of that, and then, so here's your midbrain, your pons, and your medulla. And there's the back of your brain stem. Remember, we have two colliculi here. We have the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. Um, and what I just did, uh, you should be able to not only identify all of these different things, but you should also be able to say, in short, what they do. But, right back here is going to be our cerebellum. Um, now there's two different ways that we could split the cerebellum. We could split it anatomically or we could split it um, functionally. So let's start off with anatomically. Um, so the um, there's going to be a small lobe uh, more towards the front and then there's going to be a medium sized load, uh, not load, sorry, um, lobe um, right here. So what fissures are these? Well, this is going to be the primary um, fissure. Yes, the primary fissure. I was just making sure I said that right. And then this little line is going to be the posterior lateral fissure. Um, okay, so I mean, that's good and all that we understand that, but what are these? Well, this is going to be the anterior lobe of the cerebellum. This is this big one back here is the posterior lobe. And then this one right here is the floco nodular lobe. Um, so yeah, the, um, the primary fissure separates the anterior lobe from the posterior lobe. So let's go ahead and get a posterior view of what the cere cerebellum is going to look like. So it's going to kind of look like, kind of look like this with little divots here. All right, so we're going to have our um, primary fissure right here. And then this right here, this would be the posterior lateral fissure. Um, so this is where we start talking about our functional divisions of the cerebellum. And we're going to do that based off the midline. Um, but before that, let's go ahead and do the easiest one. The floconodular lobe, that's the anatomical lobe. It is called functionally the vestibulo cerebellum. And I'm going to abbreviate that by vestibulo cerebellum, a C with two little L's. The vestibulo cerebellum. So if it's the if it's called the vestibulo cerebellum, what do you think this part of the cerebellum is going to um, what kind of stimuli is it going to interact with? It's going to be that vestibular those vestibular nuclei um, and what are what are what is that involved in? That's involved with our balance and equilibrium uh, as well as coordinating uh, to the medial longitudinal fasciculus, um, which uh, helps coordinate our eye our eye movements. Um, but yeah, let's talk about our anterior and posterior lobes now. So the middle parts, the more medial aspects of the, um, of the cerebellum is called the spino cerebellum. And then if you look at like, so here's the midline right here. So here's the midline and then here's our two dots. Um, so if you take, if you go a little bit outside of the midline, so let's go ahead and erase the midline now. This, the medial part is called the 
vermis or the vermal area. So vermis. And then the out, slightly outside of the vermis is the paravermis or the paravermal area. So this is the para, para, and then this is the other para. Um, and we learned about we learned about three main tra um, three main tracks when it comes to um, in information coming from our body to our um, to our spine. Uh, I mean, from our body, so our spine, to our cerebellum. And those were the cuneocerebellar, the uh, ventral spinocerebellar, and the dorsal spinocerebellar. And the spinocerebellar part of the cerebellum is going to be for um, the body, for, for those tracks to come in from the body and then supply this area of the, um, of the cerebellum. So... What we've learned about most parts of the um, cortex is that it's somatotropically arranged and the cerebellum is no different. And there's actually three different homunculuses, or two, depends on how you split it up. Um, so here's this guy's head, and then his body is in here, and then here's his leg, and then here's the arm. So what you should notice is that the vermal area is going to do more of our head, neck, and, uh, and spine, more of our truncal musculature um, in, in the anterior lobe, and the paravermal sections are going to be more for the extremities. That's why if only one of these areas is damaged, it's going to, it's going to uh, result in different types of um, ataxia. If the vermal area was affected if only the vermal area was affected then what is going to be what what type of ataxia is that going to be well that's the trunk so that is going to cause truncal ataxia versus the paravermal sections that would be more um extremity um ataxia and we'll talk about um how we would how we would necessarily uh, test that Okay, so we only have one more functional division of the cerebellum left, and that is the cerebrocerebellum. Cerebrocerebellum. Well, we knew that the, the vestibulocerebellum talks to the, um, the vestibular system, and the spinocerebellum uh, talks, to the, um, talks to the spine or the rest of the body. So what does the, cerebella, the cerebrocerebellum do? It's going to talk to our cortex, mainly mainly the parts of the cortex that are more associated with motor. So more of like the frontal, the frontal uh, motor, and then the uh, somatosensory uh, cortexes. This this part here, um, and that's going to be located in the periphery. So the cerebrocerebellum is going to be the lateral uh, cerebellar hemispheres. Oh, and another thing, I completely forgot about the posterior lobe. So there's going to be two little homunculi here. So there's the eyes, there's the nose, and then here's their legs, and there's their arms. And look, it's the same thing. The, their head and trunk, their head, neck, and trunk are in the vermal area, and then their extremities are in the paravermal area. Um, so... Shouldn't be too crazy. Um, key takeaways. The functional divisions and generally what they do. Vestibulo, cerebellum, talks to the vestibular system for uh, balance and equilibrium. Spinal cerebellum, it takes in proprioceptive, proprioceptive information and then modulates, um, modulates the different tracks. And then the uh, cere cerebrocerebellum, uh, that one's not that easy to say. The cerebrocerebellum, um, that is going to do, it's going to talk to the, uh, it's going to talk to the uh, cere uh, cerebral cortex. Awesome. We, uh, we killed that. Okay, good. Let's see, is there anything else I wanted to talk about? No, okay. All right, so up next, we have the deep, cerebellar nuclei so um so if we had that same picture we would have so let's just draw it again so boom and then we have our floconodular boom perfect 
So deep in the cerebellum, we are going to have um, So, I like to draw these uh, with the first letter of their name, um, uh, just because it makes it easier to learn. Okay, so, from, from, so these are all located very deep. From lateral to medial, what are these called? Well, we have the deep, I mean not the deep, the dentate nucleus, and then we have these two right here. Um, they're called the interposed nuclei whenever you're talking about them together. But these, this is your emboliform and globus uh, nuclei. And then we have the fastigial nuclei that is located the deepest. Now, um, the fastigial nuclei is predominantly no located in the uh, floconodular or the vestibulocerebellum. But... Um, it may also be in the um, in the deep uh, cerebellum, uh, like the uh, specifically the um, the spino cerebellum. It may also be located there. Okay, so we have our four um, deep. Uh, we have our four deep. So, what parts are they located in? Well, this. is is that so um these is this is our division between the spino cerebellum and then the cerebro cerebellum so we've already talked about the the vestigial nucleus is in the um uh mainly in the uh vestibulo cerebellum and it may also be in the spino cerebellum so what does the vestigial nucleus do the vestigial nucleus is going to be mainly responsible with communicating to our cranial nerve 8 vestibular nuclei. So that's the vestigial's job. It talks to cranial nerve 8. It's deeply, deeply intertwined with that one right there. The spinocerebellum, its main nuclei are the interposed nuclei, uh, ENG. The, uh, also, an easy way to remember this, don't eat greasy food. Don't eat greasy food. Um, there's a lot of others out there, but, um, but yeah. So the interposed nuclei, ENG, the emboliform, and the globus. These guys are going to be um, uh, more associated with the spino cerebellum, like I just said. And then the cerebro cerebellum, its main nuclei is going to be the dentate nuclei. So dentate, cerebro cerebellum, interposed nuclei, ENG, spino cerebellum, maybe some of the vestigial in there. Um, and then the vestigial is mainly um, associated with the uh, vestibulo cerebellum. Okay. All right, so now it's the fun part. So if we were talking about the cerebral cortex, so this is going to be very, we're going to go from deep to superficial. So we'll write deep to superficial. All right, so down here, we're going to have our deep cerebellar, um, yeah, cerebellar nuclei. So what was that? Don't eat greasy food. That's our dentate, emboliform, uh, globus, and then the uh, vestigial. This is also called the ENG together, all the interposed uh, nuclei. Okay, as so we have, we have three layers here. So we have one, two, and then we have three. So one, two, Three. Perfect. Uh, so the su most superficial layer is called our. Um, oh, well, I just realized that. Could have just went like that. Okay, so this layer up here is the molecular layer. Molecular layer. This part is the Purkinje layer. Also, always fact check my spelling. Uh, and then the deepest layer is the granular layer. Now, we could sit here and talk about, um, you know, the internal circuitry of all this. But, um, I mean, when it comes, there's not, I mean, you could get really deep into it. But this isn't a histology class. 
this is this is clinical neuroscience. We're all about um, the clinical stuff, so we'll keep it we'll keep it very brief. Um, so what's in what's in the molecular layer? Well, there's going to be a bunch of different nuclei, but this is also where um, a certain type of uh, cell down here is going to come up and then run parallel. That way the whole cerebellum can talk to each other. The Purkinje layer, there's a very important cell here, and you're not going to believe this, but it is the Purkinje cell. And that is going to, um, the Purkinje layer is going to send dendrites up through the molecular layer, um, and it's also going to um, talk to your deep, um, your deep, uh, your deep cerebellar nuclei, so deep cerebellar nuclei. It's going to talk to those guys. Um, and then the granular layer, what type of cells do you think are there? They're going to be your granule cells. Um, so, I mean, let's try not to make it um, as crazy as it could be. Um, uh, because you could get pretty far deep in the weeds. Um, but yeah, these granular cells are going to come up. So here's a gr little granul granular cell. It's going to come up. And then through the molecular layer, it is going to send parallel fibers. Um, now, there's two main ways that our that our cerebellum is going to... It, that messages are going to come into the um, cerebellum. So let's draw those. Um, oh, real quick about the Purkinje fibers. Um, so we most of the time we think of the deep cerebellar nuclei as those guys are sending efferent messages, but these Purkinje, these Purkinje cells can also um, send direct, like send a direct efferent message um, to places such as uh, our vestibular nuclei. So it, you know, it's not just the uh, vestigial nuclei that can talk to those uh, uh, cranial nerve eight vest vestibular nuclei. Okay, so the first way that afferent messages are going to get to the cerebellar cortex. Um, so here, I'll just go ahead and write this: cerebellar cortex. Just to be clear. Um, is going to be what is called climbing fibers. And there's only going to be really one type of afferent that goes through here. This is These are climbing fibers. Climbing fibers. And the, the track that's really going to do this is called the oliver, olivo uh, cerebellar. When you say olive, olive, is that, um, that has to be one of the olivary nucleuses, right? It has to be either the superior or the inferior. And it's going to be the inferior um, olivary nucleus. Inferior olivary nucleus. Yeah, that's right. Okay, just making sure. So these, these fibers are going to come up, and then it is going to... Um, they, these guys can talk directly to the um, deep uh, cerebellar nuclei, but they're also going to climb, if you will, they're going to climb up to the Purkinje layer, and then they're going to communicate with the Purkinje layer, um, and then it's going to stimulate. So this, this is probably too much in the weeds, but I'll go ahead and say it just in case, you know, it's fair game. So... The, so these fibers, the climbing fibers, release a stimulatory, I think it's asper, aspartame, maybe? Um, it releases a stimulatory neurotransmitter, and it's going to stimulate the both the deep cerebellar nuclei and the Purkinje cell. So, at first, whatever deep cerebellar nuclei we're talking about, it gets stimulated. But it stimulates this Purkinje cell, and then it comes down, it comes down, but the Purkinje cell releases a... Uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. So, um, it is true that the deep cerebellar nuclei get stimulated, but not not far after it also gets inhibited. So this is going to be more of our. Uh, it's called neural sharpening. It's to make sure that we don't undershoot or overshoot um, our messages, and that's going to be our climbing fibers. I want you to think about the inferior olives going to the cerebellum. 
all, and I think it's all, but I'll say almost all just because, you know, there's always some complexity in there. But the rest of afferent messages are going to come up via what is called mossy fibers. And that's because these are going to come up and they're, just, they're going to end in the granular layer talking to our granular cells or, our, yeah, our granular cells. Um, and these, th this is going to include almost every other, and I think it's every other, but I'll say almost, um, um, type of afferent message going to the cerebellar cortex. Okay. I know that was a lot. That was a lot. That was a lot. And it, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't think it's very clinical. I mean, the main, the main thing you have to think about there is that, oh, the, the, the message from the inferior olives to the, um, or the inferior olivary nucleus to the cerebellar cortex, um, it, it, it's a climbing fiber. And then all the other fibers, uh, that go into the cerebellum is mossy. Okay. That's a long winded way of, uh, explaining that, but you know, here we are. So let's talk about how we get in and out of the cerebellum. We get in and out of the cerebellum by the, um, by the cerebellar peduncles. And where are the cerebellar peduncles? Whoa, that's not very good. Okay, so what we got here is our brainstem. We have our midbrain. We have our pons. And then we have our medulla. This is our brainstem. And then we know that the cerebellum is going to sit all around those, all around the brainstem. So you notice that I erased three little things here, right? And these are our cerebellar peduncles. And you notice that we have three on each side. We have a superior, superior cerebellar peduncle. We have a middle cerebellar peduncle. And then we have a inferior cerebellar peduncle. Um, now, most resources I've seen say that they're, they are in each la la level of the brainstem. However, some said that they, it's all in the pons. Um, I'm going to see, I'm going to go with what I've seen most. It's in all three. We have superior in the midbrain, middle in the pons, inferior in the, um, in the medulla. Okay. So here we go. What kind of messages go in and out? So let's start off with the superior cerebellar peduncles. So the superior cerebellar peduncles, where is it? Um, best located for the cerebellum to talk to? Is it going to be, is it going to be structures in the brain stem that it's better to communicate with, or is it going to be better at communicating um, with things that are superior to it? It's going to be better at the second one. So we have our nuclei here that is, that are going to talk to um, what kind of structures? Well, it can talk to our uh, red nuclei, and it could also talk to our, our thalami, and then the thalami can send that message up to the cortex. Uh, and just if just in case we have to know uh, what specific nuclei of the thalamus, it is the ventral lateral uh, nuclei of the thalamus. So we have our red nucleus, and then we have our ventral lateral nuclei of the thalamus, and then that can send it uh, further up. So an efferent message from the uh, Cere uh, cerebellum uh, for the superior cerebellar peduncles. Well, if this message is coming from the cerebro cerebellum, which would make sense, right? That would be what nuclei? What deep cerebellar nuclei? Well, that would have been the dentate nuclei. It's going to send a message, and look what it does. It goes through the superior cerebellar peduncles, but look what it crossed. And what we know about the uh, and then it could also send it up here to the thalamus, right? But what do we know about the cer uh, cerebellum? It loves ipsilateral control. It loves ipsilateral control. But if you think about it, this kind of is ipsilateral control because both of these motor, both tracks that we're trying to uh, influence here, uh, whether it's the uh, corticospinal tracts or the, um, well, mainly the lateral corticospinal tract and the uh, rubrospinal tract. What do we know about both of those tracts? 
they cross and then they go down. So if the cerebellum is going to talk to these tracks, then what they need to do is they need to, they need to cross the midline as well. And what do we end up with? It crosses twice. That signal crossed twice. So it ends up being ipsilateral control. It's very similar to um, the afferent tract that we're about to talk about, that being the, um, the ventral spinocerebellar. So remember what we have here. So um, the ventral spinocerebellar so, tract, so this is going to be our proprioceptive information from below, around L2, or more of our lower extremity. So let's say it's from the right lower extremity, right? It's going to come in cross... And it's going to come up, 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 and then it's going to come into the contralateral superior cerebellar peduncles, and then it's going to go behind the brainstem, and then go to the cortex. And then what type of afferent message is it going to do there? It's going to be a mossy fiber because it's not from the inferior olives. So that's our main tracks for the superior cerebellar peduncles. The middle cerebellar peduncles, um, I think it's a lot easier. So here we go. So. What do we have in the basis of the pons? We had our pontine nuclei, right? And we learned that the um, corticopontine, um, corticopontine cerebellar tracts are going to come down, and then they're going to get into the cerebellum somehow. But what we need to know is that it's going to cross and then go to the pons like that. It's going to go to the cortex like that. Um, so it's mostly afferent, mostly afferent messaging uh, when we're talking about the middle. This is the, this is the only one. So um, it, it, this is our corticopontine um, cerebellar tract. Boom. It goes to the contralateral. So let's, let's write that down. I just realized I wasn't doing that. So we have the superior cerebellar peduncles. So we said it did efferent. What efferent stuff did it do? Well, it went to the red nucleus. And then what track is associated with the red nucleus? That's our rubrospinal track. So RU spinal track. Um, and it can also go to the thalamus. And then what nuclei did we say? That was the uh, ventral lateral nuclei of the thalamus. And then the thalamus is going to send that where? To the cortex to control more of our lateral corticospinal tract. And then it's afferent, main afferent. And then there's other ones, but let's keep it general to the tracks that we've talked about. This goes, this goes from, because it's an afferent, duh, the ventral spinocerebellar tract. Awesome. And then I'll erase that T because I didn't write a T up there or there. Okay, um, so then, then we talked about the middle. And then keep in mind that this was to the contralateral and to the contralateral. And then this, is it's kind of contralateral, but it's from the ipsilateral side, right? Um, and then the middle cerebellar peduncles. It's the only one we're going to talk about is the afferent, and it's the only one I've seen, is the afferent. And it's going to do uh, stuff from the cortex. And that's going to be sending the motor plan from the, um, from the uh, cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia, sending it down and then sending it to the other, um, the other pawns. And then what if, if we did want to um, affect that track, what would we do? We would send it to the opposite uh, side of the cerebrum. Therefore, it crossed twice. It's an ipsilateral control. Wonderful. So everything in the cerebellum, it's either going to be straight ipsilateral or it's going to be ipsilateral because it crossed twice. It's all about the control. The inferior cerebellar peduncles. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that we could talk about here because there's lots of stuff in the medulla, right? First, we have our reticular formation, right? And I mean, the reticular formation goes all the way up here, right? But whatever. We have a reticular formation. We have the inferior olives, right? We have our uh, cranial nerve eight nuclei here, uh, specifically the vestibular, right? Um, what else do we got? 
we have the vestibular nuclei, we have the reticular, uh, and then the olives. Okay, yeah, we're good. Uh, let's talk about from the spine first. So if we ha if we were talking about our, um, and let's draw it on this side. Inferior, inferior, cerebellar, peduncles. All right, so let's draw it on this side. So if we have our um, cuneo cerebellar, and then we have our dorsal spino cerebellar tracts, and this is going to be uh, above what? It's going to be above around C8, so it's going to be more neck and upper extremity. And then this is going to be between uh, C8 and L2 around. We ain't got to get specific. This is going to be more of our truncal, truncal trunk muscles. They're going to come up. And then they're going to go through the inferior cerebellar peduncle and then go, get to the cortex like that. What type? Mossy fibers. Cuneo cerebellar, same thing. It's just from a different part of the body. Mossy fibers. Okay, so we did those two. Uh, this, and what part of the cerebellum is that going to go to? Well, it's coming from the spine, so it's probably going to be the spino cerebellum. The spino cerebellum, so more meaty. Um, and then... So from the ones from our neck, that's going to go to the vermal area, right? Because it's more midline. And then the trunk, that's going to also go to the vermal area of the spinocerebellum. And then the upper extremity is going to go more to the permal, permavera. Wow. Perm, permavermal area. Wow. If I can spit it out. Of the, um, of the spinocerebellum. Okay. I'm running low on my uh, words today, I guess. Okay, so now let's talk about the um, cranial nerve eight nuclei. So this this track actually goes both both ways. So um, the cranial nerve eight vestibular nuclei can talk to the cerebellum, and then the cerebellum can talk to the um, cranial nerve eight nuclei. So that's both an afferent and an efferent. Um, uh, and then the reticular formation is uh, very similar as well. Um, it, it, it talk, the cerebellum talks to the reticular formation, the reticular formation talks to the cerebellum. And then we, we have two tracks that come down, right? We have the vestibular, the vestibulospinal tract, and then we have the reticulospinal tract, right? So this is yet another way that the cerebellum can uh, affect our movement, because we've already talked about that it can talk to the cortex, right? And then... It, it, by doing that, it can, it can uh, you know, fine-tune our movement when it comes to our lateral and medial corticospinal tracts. It talks to the red nucleus, so it can influence more of our um, fine, fine motor flexors of the upper extremity um, uh, via the rubrospinal tract. But it also has a hand in the reticulospinal tract and the vestibulospinal tract. And then the, the vestibulospinal, we learned that the medial coming from the more of the medulla's uh, medulla, that inferior vestibular nuclei, that's going to be more of our head and neck um, postural muscles, our extensors. And then the lateral coming from the pons, that one's going to be more of our, um, the, our extensor muscles of our body. But the reticular, the reticulospinal, that's, those are going to be, um, it's more, um, it's kind of, the, retic, the reticulospinal is a little bit more, a little, little bit different. So the medial coming from the pons is going to be more of our extensor muscles. But then the one coming from the uh, medulla, more of our uh, lateral, is going to be more of our flexor muscles. So the, retic, the reticulospinal tract does both. It does both. It depends on. It just depends on which one we're talking about. Medial does extension. Lateral does flexion. Whew. All right. Last one. Last one. Um, and then what did all of these, if they were afferent coming into the cerebellum, what did they do? They were mossy fibers. That means they were ending at the granular cell and then going. And, and then the granular cell would send them up. Oh, last but not least, the inferior olivary nucleus. So whenever it... Uh, talks to the cerebellum. Oh, whoa, just did a big no-no, sorry. So this one is weird also. So if we if we didn't talk about the um, spino-olivary tract, but we'll do it real short right now. So if we were talking about the left side of the body, it is, the spino-olivary tract is going to cross at the spinal cord, come to the inferior olives, 
and then the inferior olives is going to send it to through the contralateral inferior cerebellar peduncles. So once again, it's similar to the ventral spinocerebellar tract wherein it crosses twice. Um, and then this one's going to be slightly different from the rest of them. The rest of them do more of, you know, your, um, your, uh, what am I trying to say? Your, uh, mossy fibers. So these are all mossy fibers. This is a mossy fiber. Um, the message coming in, into, this would be a mossy fiber. Um, and you know, what track was that? That was the ventral spinal cerebellar. All of those are mossy fibers. That's how they get to the cere uh, cerebellar cortex. However, the ones coming from the inferior olives, that's going to be a climbing fiber. And why was that important? It's because um, it turns on those deep cerebellar uh, nuclei and then it almost immediately turns it back off. It's very important in, you know, um, that specific uh, part being very fine-tuned, that neural sharpening type stuff. All right, that was a lot. That was a lot. But um, and it, I find it easy if you just separate it. So the superior cerebellar peduncles, it's going to talk to more of our um, upper brain stem, so midbrain structures, and as well as um, you know our cortex and such. The middle cerebellar peduncles, that's where uh, the cerebellum is going to get the motor plan, and then the inferior inferior cerebellar peduncles. Um, it just has a lot of stuff going on because it's going to do, it's going to handle most of the stuff coming from the spine, you know, except for the spinal, ventral spinal cerebellar tract. And then it's also going to be dealing with output to our cranial nerve eight vestibular nuclei and the reticular formation, um, in the forms of, you know, our vestibular spinal tract and then our reticular spinal tract. Whew. Okay. One last thing that we need to talk about. This is the clinical aspect. Let's start off with this. If somebody's cerebellum was damaged, um, you know what? If my left uh, cerebellum was damaged, well, where where is my symptoms going to be? It's going to be on my left side. Um, but you know, we could always get more specific. We could always get more specific than that. So, big signs of cerebellar damage. We're going to use the acronym Vanished. Now, what does the V stand for? The V stands for vertigo. Um, and, you know, that's the feeling that, you know, our world is spinning around us, right? Um, you know, there's also going to be some possible nausea and vomiting. Um, so, you know, keep the, keep the trash can nearby. Um, and then the A is going to be ataxia. This is a big one. Ataxia. Now, the ataxia could be, it could be both, but it could be, truncal or it could be uh, appendicular or you know more of our extremities um you know so if it was truncal versus appendicular you know what parts of the spinocerebellum would we be looking at um that well that would be for the truncal that would be our vermal area right and then the appendicular would be more of our paravermal area and then vertigo what would that what part of the cerebellum would that uh, mostly be related to that would be more uh, associated with the vestibulo cerebellum, you know, our, our vestigial nuclei. Always good to review. In nystagmus. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Um, so what, um, so if we were talking, we talked about how um, our cerebellum can talk to the, um, our cranial nerve eight, so cranial nerve eight vestibular nuclei, right? And then we learned that the uh, cranial nerve 8 can stimulate the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And what does the medial longitudinal fasciculus do? It connects the um, cranial nerve 6 nuclei to the contralateral um, cranial nerves 3 and cranial nerve 4. So that's going to coordinate our eye movements. So if, the, if something along this track was damaged then we would show nystagmus. And that's where, um, you know, our eyes, um, you know, we're just moving our eyes and they're going to be, uh, you know, doing the, doing the wobble. Okay. And that's going to be more associated with the, uh, more so the inferior cerebellar peduncles, the um, vestibulo. So, well, right, vestibulo cerebellum again. Okay. 
All right, intention trimmer, or also called an action trimmer. But if it was action, then, you know, we, we'd have to add an A somewhere. Uh, intention trimmer. So that is where, that's going to be more of, uh, if we're going to do, if we ask our patient to do a task and, you know, they, they know how to do it, but they're just, they freeze. They almost freeze up. Um, so yeah. Uh, and what part would this, uh, signify damage in? This would be more of our, uh, motor plan and then, you know, uh, fine tuning that motor plan, whatever. That's going to be more of our uh, cerebros, uh, cerebellum, or, you know, the motor plan coming in from the cerebrum and the basal ganglia, the middle, uh, cerebellar peduncles. S is slurred or staccato speech. Slurred or staccato. I have no idea how to spell that. Speech. And that's because, you know, our, um, what track controls our, um, our, our muscles of, you know, our speech you know, that could be a variety of cranial nerves, 5, 7, uh, 9, 10, um, uh, 12, all those tracks. Um, it's good since we're not going to be able to um, use those motor tracks as well as we would like to because, you know, the cerebellum is involved with, involved with that, the, you know, the motor plan. They're either going to speak very slurred, very slurred. Um, so, you know, you could ask the patient to, the, um, the Sally cells, I can't really say it. Um, but yeah, or they're going to speak very short, very short, staccato, staccato, or slurred. All right. Uh, H is hypotonic or a pendular, like a pen. think of a pendulum, um, uh, deep tendon reflexes. So reflexes. So, uh, think about, you know, your, um your patellar, uh, well, you can't really say it, you hit it and then it goes. Um, so this uh, could just be hyp hypotonic or it could be very like a pendulum. It just keeps swinging, just keeps swinging. All right, E, an exaggerated wide base of support gate. So, uh, you know, this is also goes back to ataxia. That's going to be a very wide gate. You know, you're trying to widen out your base of support. Um, that way you don't fall because these, because it's almost like, um, you know, the drunken gate uh, is normally, um, you know, considered to be ataxia. So when, what do you do if you're drunk? Well, I mean, you've probably never been drunk, uh, but, um, you know, very wide and you're kind of, you're loosey goosey with your movements. And last but not least, we have, uh, it's this, did, oh my gosh, there's no shot I'm spelling this right. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use my paper here to spell it right. I mean, this is insane. Oh my gosh. I mean, how in the world are you gonna, kinesia? Uh, that part I know. All right. Oh my gosh. All right. So dis dido co kinesia. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I can tell you what it is. It is going to be the difficulty. Uh, so difficulty doing rapid alternating movement. So, um, you know, a really good example of this is uh, you could ask your patient to uh, go from forearm uh, supination to pronation uh, very rapidly. And, you know, they may not be able to do it as well as me because I'm the GOAT. Um, and, you know, if they had difficulty doing that, then, you know, you could uh, really be thinking about uh, dysdidocokinesia. Yes, very good. All right, guys, that was a long video. Um, however, there's only one this, uh, this week. So, you know, um, that's good at least. All right. Thank you guys.